Good morning. This is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This is February 12, 2001. And this morning we are pleased to have with us Thomas Kelly. He is Commissioner of the Department of Veterans Services for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. He brings with him a long and distinguished career in the United States Navy. He is a 30-year man, a result of action during the Vietnam War in which he was severely wounded. He earned our nation's highest military award, the Medal of Honor. It is our privilege to have him with us today. Tom Kelly, welcome aboard. Thank you, John. Good to be here. May I ask you how old you are? 61. 61 in your current address? My wife and I have eight daughters between us. We are on a second marriage. Okay, and at your age, uh, do you have grandchildren? Uh, five. You have five? <laughs> You're doing very well, sir. Where were you born, Tom? Uh, born in Boston and raised in Boston. Um, can you tell us something about your family? What did your dad do? My father was a uh, Boston school teacher. Um, and I uh, had one brother, and uh, my mother was a homemaker, and uh, went to uh, public school and parochial school and Boston College High, and then uh, on to Holy Cross College, where I graduated in 1960. Mm -hmm. You were uh, born in 1939, if I do the math correctly. Mm -hmm. Four months later, you were born in May, four months later, war broke out in Europe. Did that affect your family? Did uh, you have anybody uh, my, that served? My father in uh, was not in the service. Uh, he was um, in his late thirties about that time, I guess. But he was a he was an air raid warden. Warden used to mm -hmm. walk up and down the street, uh, and that's about our involvement with the war. I had a, a cousin and a couple of uncles who were in the war, but uh, uh, didn't know much about them until later on. How about uh, growing up in, in Boston uh, at the time you did and went to school there? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it was a great, uh, great place to grow up, uh, close neighborhoods, uh, good schools, uh, close to the church and strong family ties. Uh, we had all the advantages of uh, uh, for leading on to a, a happy and successful life, really. You graduated from Holy Cross. Um, 21 years old in 1960. That's right. Uh, you majored in economics. Yes. And you got out of school, and in 1960, uh, you, is that the year you joined the military? I, I joined the Navy uh, just about the time I graduated. I went, uh, went down, my, my roommates from college uh, went down one afternoon and joined the Navy, and I came back, they came back, and I asked them where they'd been, and they told me and I went down the next day and did the same thing. That's how I joined the Navy. Considering that you, you spent the next 30 years uh, happily employed by the Navy, I, I looked up that particular time. It was Khrushchev, Eisenhower, de Gaulle, a Cold War, the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, Nixon and Kennedy campaign, and Nixon, be, excuse me, uh, Kennedy becoming electing president. Why did you join the service? You've got a degree in economics. Well, I, I thought at that time uh, it was kind of a rite of passage to be in the to be in the military. I think, and um, uh, I had the advantage of a college education, so uh, I decided to take advantage of that and try to get in as an officer. And uh, I was fortunate enough to do so. But uh, it was almost um, something that you were expected to do, and uh, I, I just never had any any doubts about it. There was a whisper um, on the horizon when you went into service. Um, the coup in Vietnam was three years away. The Gulf of Tonkin resolution was four years away. What was the Navy like when you went into it? Uh, what, what were your expectations? Well, certainly uh, Vietnam was not on, on my personal uh, radar scope or probably anybody's in the Navy's. Uh, it was the Cold War and kind of a, um, might even say the height of the Cold War. We were worried about the Soviet Union with their mm -hmm. uh, missiles and with their ability to put somebody on the moon. And uh, it was about the time JFK came along and, and uh, kind of woke the country up and said, hey, we need, he said, we need your help. And um, uh, I was in the Navy uh, about that time uh, before he made his famous speech about ask not what you can do for your country, but 
you know, what, what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. But that was ge the general feeling that, uh, hey, um, even though we won World War II and we supposedly had a safe place, uh, it, the world is not necessarily a safe place. So I guess uh, part of my motivation was to uh, kind of help make it a little safer place. You said your buddies had gone into town and uh, they signed up, so you did. Mm -hmm. Did you give any thought to joining uh, some other branch of service? Well, when I, when I was getting out of high school, I uh, had tried to get, get into the, uh, to the military academies, uh, West Point, uh, uh, Annapolis, uh, Coast Guard Academy, and, and uh, uh, Maritime Academy. And because my, ice, my eyesight did not measure up for an academy education, and I, uh, I uh, wasn't able to get in, that among other reasons probably, but uh, I kind of put it on the back burner for four years, and then when it came time to get out of college, uh, I, I thought about it again, really. So you, you joined the Navy. Mm -hmm. um, where did the Navy send you? Well, I started off by going through uh, Officer Candidate School down in, down in Newport, Rhode Island, and then uh, my first tour of duty was in uh, minesweepers down in Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, for the next several years, I served on a couple of destroyers uh, in Newport and went to the Mediterranean, went to the Western Pacific, uh, went to the coast, off the coast of Vietnam. And then uh, finally in 1968, after I had pretty much committed to stay in the Navy, uh, they sent me to a tour in country Vietnam. Okay, you're, you're getting ahead of me here. Okay. You're going faster than I am. Tell me about basic training. What did you do as, in well, OCS? Well, it was one of these 90-day wonders, I guess you call them, although I think it was probably more like 120 days. But uh, uh, they teach you uh, that the, the right-hand side of the ship is called starboard and the left-hand side of the ship is called port. That's very important. And the yeah. pointy end is the bow and the other end is the stern. And how to navigate a little bit and how to shoot guns and uh, uh, trace an engineering steam system on a ship and things like that. And then when you've done all those things, they also teach you to march and carry a, a rifle. And that was the last time I did either one. But uh, after three or four months of that, they pronounced me uh, an officer and a gentleman and said, uh, you're, you're now in the United States Navy. They start calling you mister. What did you like or dislike about uh leaving college, four years of college, and then going into the service? I, I, I had gone to a, uh, a Jesuit high school and a Jesuit college, uh, and so uh, they, they run a pretty tight ship, both, uh, both in high school and college, so going into the Navy really was um, just more of the same. Uh, the Navy didn't really throw anything at me that I hadn't experienced at, uh, at uh, college and high school. So uh, the discipline and the uh, uh, accountability and stuff like that. That was kind of second nature to me thanks to the nice education I had received. You be sure and tell us as we go along here at what point you got married, whether in... Um, I, it, yeah, I'll it, tell it, you, I hadn't got married yet. I okay, I because I think it's that. important to the narrow, narrative that's unfolding here. Uh, did you receive the advanced or specialized training after... Uh, uh, no, just uh, fairly basic uh, communications training, but that was just to get me ready for the, my first assignment aboard ship. Something we, we we're interested in here is, did the Navy prepare you for cultural differences you might expect? See the world, join the Navy and see the world. Did they tell you how to behave in that world or what you might expect out there? Oh, that, that's a great question, but uh, I, I'd have to say uh, no. Um, they just advised that you be on your best behavior when you go into a foreign port, particularly because you are ambassadors of the United States and all, but um, the, uh, the, the world that sailors face in going to these foreign places is a lot, is a lot different from what you might find in Natick or South Boston or a place like that. Uh, I, I don't think they went overboard in, in uh, preparing us for that. You talked uh, just a moment ago about your buddies coming and signing up in the Navy. Did you go to Newport by yourself, or well, we all went down together? Actually, you yeah. went as a group. Yeah, we went. Uh, uh, in, we went individually, but uh, we we went through the same training together for the first four months or so. Then, then we all split. And went you scattered. Yeah. Uh, did you ever pick them up again oh, any time sure. in I'm your still, career? Uh, I'm still close to uh, to them. 
Okay, on your resume for 1960 to 1977, it said you were given appropriate junior officer assignments and you just uh, remarked on three tours at sea. You were a department head tour in three ships. Mm -hmm. uh, you were also command of a modern fast frigate, the USS Lang, mm -hmm. out of San Diego. Yes. Um, 290 men aboard. Tell us about that. Well, that uh, command of a ship is, I guess, the ultimate, uh, the ultimate goal of any, anybody uh, who, who decides to become a naval officer. And so I was very fortunate in, in uh, being given command, being placed in charge of this, uh, this uh, weapon and these 290 or so bodies and souls. Uh, a real challenge because uh, it, it was at a tough time in the Navy when uh, uh, the military was experiencing a lot of drug problems, just like society was in general. Uh, there was a certain amount of breakdown of some of the old uh, moral standards that probably you and I grew up with. So uh, coping with them and trying to keep the ship going uh, was, was a real challenge. And it, the, the first uh, year or so that I had command, uh, we had to get rid of about a tenth of the crew, more than, a, more than 10 percent of the crew for drug problems, uh, unsuitability problems, things like that. But fortunately we were able to uh, get rid of them, uh, get them out of the Navy, and the last year and a half or so was a, was a real joy. Uh, had some good people. And, and on board the line. On board the ship, yeah, yeah. on board the line. And we made uh, two trips to the Western Pacific during that time, a uh, six-month cruise and a seven-month cruise. So we were gone a lot. Mm. I'm looking at this uh, perhaps from my perspective as a civilian, that uh, I'm out there, I'm a young kid, you're 21 years old when you get into all of this. You had a couple of tours at sea, but now you're running a fast frigate for the United States Navy. Mm. Um, that's a heck of a responsibility. Oh, sure it is. But, but, but you, as, you, as you come up from uh, that first assignment in 1960 or so as a 21-year-old uh, kid, uh, you, you are fortunate enough to be surrounded by some, some very capable uh, petty officers and other officers whom you learn from and uh, you see how, how they respond to certain challenges. You pick and choose and discard some and adopt the others and you kind of build your own uh, way of doing things. And so by the time I was given this ship, given command of this ship in 1977, I was, uh, I was 38 years old or so and I was uh, a little more mature and a little more experienced than I was several years earlier. Wouldn't it be safe to say that um, all the guys who went into the Navy when you did didn't wind up captaining ships? Isn't well, there something in you that the Navy, Navy has already seen? Well, uh, that's true to a certain extent. Uh, a lot of them, the, the ones that went in with me, uh, of my particular class in OCS, I think, uh, of maybe, let's say, a hundred young men, uh, uh, only two of us, I think, ended up staying in the Navy for a career. Uh, now, there are other sources of, um, of uh, becoming an officer, like the Naval Academy, ROTC, and that type of thing. So I would say of the people who joined the Navy and stayed in the Navy at the same time I did, I would say uh, roughly half of them w would be uh, given a command uh, later on at, at the appropriate time in mm -hmm. their career. So it's, it's not like uh, one in a million. It's, uh, it's expected if you do a if you do uh, the job the Navy expects of you, then you're going to be rewarded, if you will, with, uh, with a command. You were on the Lang how long? Uh, about um, 30 months or so. And when did you leave that ship? I left in early 1980. Uh, I came back to uh, the East Coast and uh, served in Newport, Rhode Island for a couple of years and then went over to um, Yokohama, Japan and Seoul, Korea for five years. Okay, we're, we're again jumping ahead. Jumping ahead. Mm -hmm. um, from your resume, I, I've got you down as serving a 10-month tour um, in the Republic of Vietnam mm -hmm. as a River Assault Division commander. Right. Can you tell us what that is? Okay, uh, I was part of what they call the, uh, the Joint Army-Navy Mobile Riverine Force and it's uh, uh, made up of, um, in my case, 25 or so boats in River Assault Division 152. 
uh, whose mission was to support uh, a battalion of, of uh, U.S. Army troops. And our job was to um, take these troops along the canals and the rivers of uh, Republic of Vietnam, Mekong Delta area, um, drop them off, provide fire support for them while they went on their missions on, on, on the land and then pick them up and mm -hmm. uh, move them to another location or take them back home or whatever. When you left the Lang, did you then, was your next assignment in Vietnam? No, my, my, uh, I was in Vietnam in 1968, 69, okay. so I was, uh, that was well before I was on the Lang. I was, okay, uh, I've got those backwards then. Right, I was, I was in the Lang, uh, I was in Vietnam <clears throat> as a 29-year-old or 30-year-old. Tell us about going to Vietnam. It, it, it was there now. Okay, it, it was there, and, yeah. and certainly uh, uh, all of us were aware, were aware of it then, um, we, where this country was. We, we had found it on the map, and uh, mm -hmm. a lot of our friends were going there, and uh, the uh, country was obviously committed to, uh, to helping this country over there. And uh, at, at that stage, in my, I was a Korea naval officer at that point, I had decided to stay in. And uh, I decided that was, in my case, that was a, the place to be to, uh, to, to, to try to do my bit. And so that's what motivated me to volunteer to go over there. You volunteered to go over to oh, Vietnam. Sure. Yeah. Did, did you have any druthers as to what capacity you would I wanted to go over on a, on, a, on a boat, one of the small boats, and there were several types of small boats over there, and uh, patrol boats, um, assault boats, which I ended up on, mm -hmm. um, other, other types of boats, too. In this Division 152, uh, you had under your command eight river assault craft? Well, in general, I had about, about 25, but on a particular operation that mm -hmm. took place on uh, June 15, 1969, I think there were about eight boats with me that day. Can you describe one of these boats uh, for okay. a landlubber? Yeah, it's, a, it's about a 45, 50 foot uh, landing craft and if you uh, watch the old World War II movies, they're the boats that uh, troops would use to make an amphibious landing on the beach. We call them LCM-6s or Mike boats. Uh, they have a ramp at the front and you, the, they drive up on the beach, the ramp goes down and uh, the troops uh, run off. And, uh, to do their thing on land. That's, and we, that was primarily what we had. We also had um, a few heavily armored boats with uh, um, 20 millimeter cannons and things like that, which we used for fire support for the troops. Is this a monitor? Uh, the, the monitor was one of them. You were sailing on a monitor. Yeah, with it was the up. same hull as the uh, earlier ones I described. It was just that instead of having a ramp that went down, they loaded it with guns and things like that. And uh, it was the same basic, uh, basic hull design, however. Okay, I'm going to mispronounce some words here, and you, you're going to help me out if you would. Um, on Sunday, the 15th of June, 1969, you are 30 years old, one month and two days. Right. And you're sailing up the Ang Mong Canal? That, that's close enough. That's okay, close enough. in Kenho Province. Kenwa. Kenwa. Kenwa, okay. Why? What, what was your objective? Well, our, our mission that day was to, uh, to move this uh, group of soldiers from the 9th Infantry Division, to move them uh, at various spots along the canal and along the river, insert them, uh, provide fire support for them before we landed them, come back and pick them up and move them to another location while they went and searched out uh, uh, enemy, enemy forces. And that's what we were doing that day. And we had done it all day. This was about the fourth or fifth extra, uh, insertion and extraction of the day. You pick them up and ride them further down the canal? Yeah, or, right. You know. That's about it. And how do you know where the enemy is? Oh, um, a lot of it is just uh, going to look for them. I think the Army had little sensors out there that could uh, perhaps uh, pick up where they were. Um, there were um, helicopters overhead which could sometimes uh, spot them. And uh, it was just known to be a heavy uh, Viet Cong area, I guess from local intelligence and things like that. Plus we'd been down there a couple of days earlier and gotten a fairly, fairly big firefight, so we knew they were still there. So you'd, you've had this experience before, 
and it worked. You got your boats and the troops all together where you were sure. supposed to go. Right. But on this particular day, uh, if I'm reading your history correctly, one of your troop carriers reported a mechanical failure right. of a loading ramp. Because while we were back loading them, and the troops were coming back on board, and there were four or five boats on uh, beached, and the troops were coming back onto these boats, and one of them couldn't get its ramp up, so uh, it had to stay on the beach while they worked on getting the ramp up. Uh, that's why, uh, and then, um, the uh, Viet Cong opened open fire on that boat from across the across the canal. What kind of stuff was thrown at you? Uh, uh, was, were you hit uh, by rockets? It was rocket propelled grenades primarily. Yeah. Mortars, rocket propelled grenades, um, uh, small arms, AK 47s, which are 7.62 millimeter. Um, um, cartridges, and maybe something similar to a 50 caliber machine gun, uh, not quite 50 caliber, but something of that range. So th they were, they opened up quite a bit from across. That's a lot of weight coming. It is at a you. lot of weight. Yeah. It, was that unusual for you? Oh no, that that was. They had a pretty good uh, arsenal of weapons down there, and they kept them pretty well hidden, and would pop up and use them, and then duck down again. Okay. Like spider holes. What happened then? Well, we, uh, I was out in the uh, stream on the, the monitor that I was riding, and you got to remember, I was in charge of this group of uh, boats, so I was responsible for their safety and making sure the operation went off okay. So I just went over towards where the uh, um, fire was coming from and, you know, tried to uh, suppress the fire. And um, um, one of them scored a, luck, a lucky hit uh, right, on, right on the boat that I was riding and uh, fired a rocket propelled grenade which detonated uh, very close to my head, maybe six inches from my head. And you know, sprayed shrapnel all over the place, knocked me for a loop and everything. And uh, I was able to, I was holding on to a couple of radios, you know, talking to the troops on the beach and talking to the other boats. And I was able to keep talking to them as, as I fell down and everything and kept the fight going and managed to suppress the fire and get everybody out of there. That's very casually said, but uh, well, as, as history shows, the United States Navy thought a great deal of what you did that day. Right, they they did, and uh, it was a question of being in the being in the right place at the right time. That's uh, that's like one way to look at it. <laughs> and um, you know, I, I got I got hit pretty pretty badly, but uh, fortunately, no uh, no lasting. Uh, I was I was able to continue to function. And uh, because of that, I, I, I survived. Uh, we managed to get out of there and without any other losses or any other casualties. And uh, uh, once we got out of the, once we suppressed the firefight, uh, one of the boats came alongside and a corpsman came jumping on board, uh, gave me immediate first aid, which saved my life until I could be uh, medically evacuated by a helicopter. So. Isn't part of this action also the fact that uh, didn't you pull between this uh, oh, right. disabled craft? Oh, sure. Uh, you mean, put yourself was, in harm's way, as well, there were. It was really about the only thing I could do. I mean, it, I, I was on the boat that was uh, heavily armored, you know, better than the others. So uh, that was my job, was to uh, kind of keep the fire away from them and on us. I, I didn't intend to have them hit me, though, but uh, that's okay. They did. It did. They got you. Lucky shot. <clears throat> well, for this action, eventually you were awarded the Medal of Honor, is that correct? Yes, I was, about a year later. About a year later. Mm -hmm. uh, let's do two things here first. Your medical treatment, were you uh, helicoptered well, was, out of there? Yeah, or, I was yeah. medevaced out of there by helicopter, and I went to one of these uh, uh, field hospitals or for aid stations, I guess, and I, I, I don't know how long I stayed there because I kind of passed out for a few weeks. And uh, I, I got treatment at a field hospital and at another hospital in Vietnam. And then um, I think I was flown up to Japan for some treatment and then back down to uh, the Philippines for some treatment and then eventually to uh, Hawaii, to a uh, triple hospital in Hawaii. And um, I was kind of in and out of consciousness for, you know, most of that, I guess, three or four or five weeks, something like that. 
and then uh, when I when I finally got to Hawaii, I was I was in pretty good shape. Uh, I was I was able to go home after a couple of weeks. Have you looked back at uh, a juxtaposition that I find interesting that um, that happened in 1969? And that was the year literally hundreds of thousands of people in the United States were, were demonstrating against the Vietnam War. Right, it was the year Lieutenant William Calley uh, was ordered to stand trial for the My Lai Massacre. A lot was going in two directions. Right. You had a lot of time of, to think about that, didn't you? Well, uh, prior to getting hit on uh, June 15, 1969, uh, what was happening back in the States really seemed uh, very, very remote from what we were mm -hmm. doing over there in Vietnam. And uh, I, I knew at the time I went over there, which was uh, October or, or September of 68, I, I knew there was some dissension, but uh, I was a, a naval officer and I was being sent over there, so it, it never occurred to me to, uh, to, to question anything that was going on. Uh, when I came back, uh, having having experience wartime and uh, uh, seeing the actions of my fellow sailors and marines and soldiers over there, I, I knew they were doing a noble thing, so it, it, it did irritate me to, uh, to have people back here questioning what our young men were doing over there. Uh, I think we all subsequently, then and subsequently, began to question some of the decisions made by our leaders, but uh, at no time did I ever question uh, the integrity or the honor of those serving over there. Mm -hmm. Would you do something for us, um, for the benefit of those of us who have never been near Vietnam? What was it like? What was it like to go up these rivers and uh, not quite sure where anybody is? And well, who not only uh, did you not know where people were, but you, um, those people you did see, you didn't know if they were good guys or bad guys. Um, uh, we, we would sail by, and when I'm talking about rivers, I'm talking about rivers that are maybe 100 meters wide, uh, the width of a football field. Um, so you could see on both sides, uh, there were sometimes people, there were cows, water buffaloes, uh, little villages, little kids playing. Uh, but then again, uh, at the end of the village, uh, somebody might take a pot shot at you, and you know, somebody from within the village. So uh, it, the rules were such, of course, that uh, you know you, you really could not retaliate, nor would you want to retaliate uh, in an area where there were uh, innocent civilians. But you never knew how innocent the civilians were. So it was uh, um, it, it was not cut and dried. It was not like uh, maybe on Peleliu or Guadalcanal or someplace where uh, I, I think you knew who the enemy was, even though you might not be able to see him, but. Uh, um, slightly different ground rules. This is something called rules of engagement. I, w I would assume. Tell us more about that. You're not allowed to well, respond to somebody shooting at you. Well, yeah, it was tempered with uh, good judgment, I suppose. For example, we uh, we were not allowed to use uh, 50 caliber machine guns uh, without getting permission from quote higher authority because of the possible ricochet of the mm. uh, of the rounds. And, and a 50 caliber machine gun could travel a, a pretty good distance, uh, maybe 5,000 yards or something like that. So uh, you, you really weren't allowed to use them except in certain areas. Um, uh, if you're in a populated area and came under fire, uh, you were told to get out of there, really, uh, rather than to return fire. Now, the incident that I was involved in, uh, where I got hit, that was not a populated area. That was down in the in a very remote area. There were no civilians, no, no hooches or villages or things like that in the immediate area. So there was no question we were under fire and we were allowed to return fire. Did you consider yourself basically transportation for the Army? Pretty much. Transportation and providing fire. You're, you're not an them. infantry brigade or a battalion? Right. Uh, we, we carried them where they wanted to go. We, when we went into an area, we we had a uh, we would prep the area with with fire. In other words, with our guns, shoot shoot up the area so that if anybody was there, they'd stay down when the troops were coming in. When you're out on your boats, um, you're the captain. Uh, you're the captain, the monitor, and responsible at that particular time for eight other mm -hmm. boats. 
Um, what kind of help did you have when you needed to make decisions? Well, it's every one of the boats had a, a boat captain who was generally a, a, a second class petty officer, E5, uh, like a sergeant in the Marine Corps. No, I mean in terms of command decision. Oh, well, I, if I had any, uh, uh, I, I, would, I, re I would report back on the radio to my uh, uh, squadron commander who was back at the home base that we were under fire or doing this out of the other thing. and. Uh, if I if I needed artillery support or helicopter support or something like that, I would ask for it. But as far as the decisions made on the spot, that was that was really my responsibility. How about uh, help from uh, from the sky? Yeah, uh, can you call in helicopters or sure. gunships or absolutely. In fact, the day that the day in question, uh, June fifteenth, on our earlier missions that day, we had uh, helicopter support from uh, Navy helicopter squadron. Uh, Cal 3 is the name of the squadron, Sea Wolves, what they were called. And uh, they were supporting us all morning, and then as the afternoon wore on, they had another mission somewhere. So the, uh, as the day went on, we didn't have the support, which probably was the reason we got hit that day. Do you feel that your officers to whom you reported and for whom you asked for support um, offered you what you needed oh, sure. Absolutely. at all times? Right. I mean, I, we, we were well-trained, well-supported. Uh, we were not thrown into the breach or anything like that, I, I don't think. Was there um, inter-service cooperation? Oh, it, it had to be. It was a joint operation, Army-Navy. And the, uh, the uh, riverine force that I was part of had two, two commanding officers, an Army colonel and a Navy uh, captain. And, the, and they, they ran things together jointly. It was the first and probably best example of joint warfare that uh, has happened, and uh, very, very little uh, antagonism or lack of cooperation. I know this sounds like a trite question, but uh, what were the greatest challenges you faced when you were in combat? Um, oh, there, there really weren't too many challenges. I, I think uh, everybody knew that they were in a tough area, and uh, everybody was was uh, careful, everybody was uh, doing what they were trained to do. Um, nobody, nobody took it casually, and everybody's morale was pretty good. It, it was not a tough assignment at all. Despite uh, getting shot up. Mm -hmm. yeah. You were wounded, as you told us, and you were treated rather quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, and you say you got good medical care and you wound oh, yeah, up in Hawaii. Yeah. Um, how did you hear about the progress? Of the, how did you get out of the microcosm of the war and hear what was going on in Vietnam? Well, I, after, after I uh, got back on my feet, um, I, I was put on limited duty by the Navy for a year or so while they decided whether or not to uh, to let me stay. And uh, so I was assigned to the uh, Pacific Fleet commander right there in Hawaii to his staff. And uh, I was uh, on the put in charge of uh, uh, helping the Vietnamese Navy get on its feet so we could turn things over to the Vietnamese Navy. So, you know, that kept me abreast of what was going on. Were you at Pearl Harbor? I was Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Uh, kept me abreast of what was going on. I even made a couple of trips back over there um, in the next year or two to see what was going on. So I, I was very, very clear as to it, how things were going. And, you know, they weren't going that well, actually, to be very honest with you, because we decided to, to pull out in, in 1972. I want to get back in a minute uh, as to your relationship with the uh, Vietnam, Vietnamese um, Navy. But let me ask you, before the combat that you were in mm -hmm. and the relationship uh, with the Army, uh, how much did you know about the enemy that you faced? Well, before we went over there, we went to uh, uh, some sort of, you, you mentioned cultural training earlier. Mm -hmm. And I think that they, part of our preps for going to Vietnam, we, I went to a f um, two or three month uh, school out in California we learn how to run the boats and uh, conduct operations and things like that. Go through survival training and s escape and s uh, evasion training. And if I recall, we had about two or three hours of uh, 
uh, intercultural relationship training, which really told us a little bit about Vietnamese history, history of the country, uh, um, history of uh, the war, uh, that type of thing. The, the French engagement. The, the French, yeah. and, uh, the long history, the Japanese during World War II, and then the French, and, uh, and now the, the fight against uh, the Viet Cong and the North uh, Vietnamese and that type of thing. And I think we had about two hours of that, um, and, and that was about it. Now, um, I, I didn't have any, exp I didn't have any um, contact with Vietnamese civilians when I was over there for my whole tour because uh, uh, I was working with the U.S. Army primarily and occasionally with the Vietnamese Navy. Uh, occasionally we'd have to go uh, into a village and you know, spend the night in a village or something or our boats would be near a village. But uh, <coughs> uh, very little contact with the, with the average Vietnamese civilian. What was your opinion of the people you were going to face before you went into battle? The, the uh, Viet Cong or the enemy? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, while I was in school getting ready to go over, they sent us to the training out in California. I think it was Newsweek or Time or one of those magazines ran an article about, uh, about the outfit I was going to. And um, during, during the Tet celebration of 1968, which is the Vietnamese New Year, uh, there was a great uprising across the country by the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese and they had really uh, given us somewhat of a black eye and it kind of gave us a, a, a wake-up call. The Great Tet Offensive. The Great Tet Offensive. Yeah. And, and this particular article I was reading talked about the outfit I was going to and said that they had uh, incurred something like uh, 80 or 90 percent casualty rate uh, uh, so I, 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 I read that and I was wondering <laughs> if I'd made the right choice. Yeah, let point. me see those papers again. Yeah, gee whiz. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I certainly had respect for them, but uh, the, the, the most frustrating part was uh, you, you never saw them. Uh, they were very good at keeping, keeping hidden until they were, they were ready to announce themselves and to, uh, to give you a hard time. They were very, very, very formidable uh, foe. And, and later on, you know, I read about how they uh, subsi subsisted on uh, a bag of rice a day or uh, with these uh, handmade thongs on their feet and things like that. They, they were very, very, uh, they were very, very tough, in my opinion. Did you feel you were properly equipped on that particular day uh, that <clears throat> the United States has supplied you with uh, the best weapons? Uh, for the situation? I think so, yes. In fact, even down to the mundane of, uh, uh, they had issued me uh, goggles, these heavy plastic industrial goggles, which uh, people who work around uh, grinders and things would wear. And uh, in addition to a helmet and flak jacket and stuff like that, well, I was wearing these goggles uh, that day even though it was a hot day, very uncomfortable. I was wearing them and, and I, I didn't like wearing them because they were very uncomfortable. But uh, those goggles, at a minimum, saved the sight of my left eye because uh, I later saw the goggle, it was peppered with shrapnel, which uh, if I hadn't been wearing the goggles, my <coughs> eye would have been peppered with shrapnel. This eye was lost, uh, but uh, at a minimum, it saved me from being uh, completely losing my sight, if not my life. So yeah, I was well, well equipped. Did we, you guys wear flight uh, flak jackets? We were issued flak jackets. Yeah, it's and, too uh, hot to wear them. Oh yeah, it was hot. Yeah. So uh, I happened to have mine on that day. Um, a lot of guys didn't, and uh, you know, um, I figured they they issued it to us to us for a reason. You know, I don't know. As your mother would say, it paid off, right? It paid off, right. <laughs> Did you feel that the weapons and, and all the equipment you had were uh, better than, worse than, about the same as what the uh, Viet Cong were carrying? I, I think they were at least as good. I know uh, when, the, uh, when the M16 uh, rifle first came out, and I think that was before I, well before I got over there, I, I, I had heard there were some problems with the M16, but I think those got corrected. It so jammed a lot. Yeah. They jammed. Or it yeah. might have been the ammo. I'm not sure. But uh, I, I had, you know, little minor things. Some of the, we had a, um, 
a grenade launcher, uh, I think they call it a Mach 18 or Mach 19 grenade launcher that fed these uh, grenades through and fired them. Uh, they used to jam up a lot, but you know, that's happened in every war, every, every, everywhere, I'm sure. I'm sure the enemy had the same problems. You mentioned a minute ago from Pearl going back to Vietnam a couple of times in the line of duty. Uh -huh. Uh, had you ever gone back after the the war was all over? No, I've never. I haven't been back since uh, 1973 or so. It was 72 was probably the last time I was. So there. it was official duty that you went back. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people do go back now, but uh, I have not. Okay, we're going to pick up on something you mentioned a, a minute ago. From Pearl Harbor, you were assigned several duties mm. uh, f for the fleet. Right. And you were responsible for the Republic of Vietnam Navy. Is right. that correct? Well, I, I was responsible for uh, um, kind of helping with the, the turnover of the United States Navy assets, or ships, or resources, whatever, to the Vietnamese Navy to try to build them up so that, so that we could uh, back away. It was called a Vietnamization uh, program. That's Nixon's program then, yeah, President right. Nixon's program. In fact, um, just before I left Vietnam, before I got hit in, in, um, in uh, June of 1968, a couple of months before that, uh, the unit I was with had actually turned over its boats to the Vietnamese Navy. So when I was in Division 152, that was kind of a new assignment for me. So that's on, that was ongoing, and I think by uh, 72, it was virtually complete that every, every, all the Navy uh, uh, squadrons and boats and some aircraft and uh, even large ships were turned over to the Vietnamese Navy. Generally when that program is thought of, the, the uh, Vietnamization of the war right. so we could disengage, right. uh, I've always thought of it in terms of the Army, more the Army. I, I think this is the first time I'd given any thought that the, the Navy was involved. How did they do, and, and who trained them? Um, we, we trained them. Uh, we trained them. We set up a supply system, a logistics system for them. And uh, one, of the, one of the failures, I think, of the, of the whole Vietnamese, Vietnamization effort, at least from the Navy's perspective that I saw, was that we we, the United States Navy, the Defense Department, the United States, uh, jammed this system down their throats and said, uh, this is the way we do it in the United States Navy, this is the way you're going to do it, uh, make it work. And uh, here are these computers uh, that we use for our logistics and supply, and uh, we set up huge supply centers uh, in Norfolk and San Diego, so you need a huge supply center somewhere over there. And, and um, it, uh, it, it didn't work. It's not the way they'd ever done business before. Uh, they were reluctant to do it our way, and uh, they ran into some uh, problems in, in uh, making it work. Was the center of all this Cameron Bay? Um... Cameron Bay was a big uh, deep water uh, port, um, probably their major port. Da Nang, Cameron Bay, um, Saigon, and um, not Trang, I think, with the with the four big ports mm -hmm. over there, and uh, you know we built bases for them, just like uh, we have along the east and west coast of the United States. Um, probably put uh, PXs and uh, things like that, like we have, and uh, that's that's the Viet Cong didn't have any of that stuff, uh, and they. they uh, they uh, were able to survive without all that type of thing. I'm, I'm sure the Vietnamese Navy, Army could have done the same thing without all the accoutrements. When you hand a, a country the size of Vietnam a Navy and say, here, take care of this, have they got the means or the um, military history know-how to work with this? They, they, ha they certainly have a, a military history. They've been fighting invaders for uh, a lot longer than this country's been around. Um, their, their, their famous naval hero is a fellow named Tran Hung Dao from the, from the uh, 15th century. 
So they've been fighting invaders uh, on the sea and on the rivers and on the land uh, uh, for hundreds and hundreds of years. So yes, they did have a, a, a warrior um, uh, background. But uh, to, to uh, force them to do it our way, I think, was a mistake. Mm -hmm. You were doing that up through 1977, if my notes are correct. Um, where, what else did you do other well, than go I, I, to Vietnam? I only did that, uh, John, for until um, 1972. I only did it for a couple of years. Then the Navy said I could stay in. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so I went from there, tried to resume a regular career. And I uh, went, I had a, a tour in Washington and personnel, and then I was uh, executive officer of a destroyer. Well, I, I've got that starting in 77. No, that was... Is, is that wrong? That was... Uh, that would have been uh, 73, I think, 1973, the USS Sample of Pearl Harbor. I was executive officer, number two guy on the ship. Well, I've got you back on the, um, the Lang. That was in 77, so... That okay, was that's... Then I've got it. A modern fast frigate with 20 officers, 270 enlisted men, mm -hmm. and we, you worked in Pacific Fleet operations. Where did you go in that thing, and what did you do? Was it on the Lang? Yeah. Uh, we went out to, um, oh, Malaysia, or Cambodia, uh, um, Philippines, Japan, uh, Indian Ocean, Australia, uh, all over for us, about nine months. But two, actually, made two seven-month cruises during that time. Were you just showing the flag, or what? Uh, what and were you we're, doing? We're not just showing the flag. We were. Uh, um, at one point, there was a bit of a conflict between a potential conflict between China and uh, Taiwan, and uh, we sailed up and down between the, between mainland China and Taiwan just to, you know, try to keep the peace a little bit. But China backed off. Um, we did a lot of training with our allied navies, the Philippine Navy, Japanese Navy, uh, Indonesian Navy, Singapore, uh, Australia, uh, some of those countries. And um, that's about it, really. Back in 1972, we didn't talk about this a minute ago, the Navy gave you, or you earned, a master's degree in management. Mm. Um, did they ask you to do this, or is this something you were interested in doing? Um, I, I think they, I don't recall if I volunteered for that. I, it, it was in Monterey, California, so I have a feeling I volunteered because uh, it's kind of a nice spot to go. And it was, uh, it was not a very arduous year out there. It was a very nice year. So uh, I, I, it, it was a, a good respite from, uh, from normal Navy duties. Reading your history, it seems to me that a lot of you, what you did subsequent to that or uh, following getting that degree, uh, it was very useful to you. Oh, a lot sure. of the assignments you got. Yeah, it was, uh, it was not a technical degree. It was more of a management, management uh, degree. And as you uh, uh, advance in the Navy, uh, you know, you, you get into more and more management positions or leadership positions. So yeah, I, I would say it was useful. 1980, um, you were named Director of Administration, Naval Education and Training Center at Newport, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And that's where you started it, I believe, is that's right, at Newport. Place. Absolutely. Uh, managed the largest department of a major naval shore activity whose mission was the training of several thousand naval officers and enlisted personnel. What did you do specifically there? Well, I was kind of the, uh, the landlord for, for all the facilities there. Um, we provided the, the, uh, the barracks, the food, uh, um, the discipline, uh, operations, that type of thing for, for the base as a whole, and uh, kind of the, the support branch of the base. Including eight home ported ships. They what were, does home ported mean as a were phrase? Eight destroyers that, uh, that that was their home base was Newport. Eight eight destroyers were home base there, and subsequent to that, uh, they all left and went went elsewhere. So now there are no no ships down in Newport. But at that time, there were eight. You were also dealing with uh, vessels from the uh, NATO. 
organization? They'd come in for port visits and things like that, and we'd have to you know, provide for their logistics needs and stuff like that. What do you do when 400 guys sail up and say, here we are? Oh, hey, they're so happy to be in Newport. Uh, you know, they, we give them fuel, we give them water, we give them food. Uh, they order it all in advance. It's delivered to the ship, and then we just uh, help them have a good time while they're there. If they need anything fixed or repaired, we arrange for, uh, you know, uh, repair services, that type of thing. Now, this is at Newport, mm -hmm. um, and are there facilities there large at enough that, to... At that time, there was a, uh, a maintenance activity, a reserve, Navy Reserve maintenance activity right there on the, on the pier. And uh, these Navy reservists would come in for two or three weeks and do their active duty for training and um, fix these, these Navy ships or support these Navy ships while they were, while they were doing it. That's, that's since uh, gone away. We've skipped over. You're getting promoted here. 80 to 82 is what we're talking about now. What, what is your rank at this particular time? Uh, I think I became a captain uh, in the Navy in 1982 or so, which is uh, when I ended up as a captain when I retired eight years later. One of the things that you did at Newport that caught my eye was administered a naval correctional facility, a brig, for sailors and marines awaiting disciplinary action. Mm -hmm. um, and exercise special court martial authority for all enlisted personnel assigned to the, ge the geographic area. What did that entail? We had a lot of uh, uh, transient people, uh, students, um, uh, people from the, the ships who were being transferred elsewhere or who got in trouble on the ships and were uh, kind of dumped ashore. And uh, one, of my, one of my jobs was to uh, be their commanding officer while they were there and to uh, um, investigate discipline cases and, if necessary, uh, convene court marshals. And, and, uh, if convicted, uh, then they'd go to the brig, and I was in charge of the brig also. The brig is where it's, it's, a, it's a prison. How serious were some of these court-martials? Where they get up to a general court-martial, which could entail a death penalty? Oh, no. It was mostly uh, unauthorized absentees, uh, some fairly minor drug offenses. That's a deck. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they, they could be confined for up to uh, six months. Anything over six months, they'd go elsewhere for their confinement. Portsmouth uh, Naval Prison in New Hampshire mm -hmm. or Fort Leavenworth. Um, I don't recall any, any really major cases like that. That's an interesting uh, sidebar on your resume. And right. I, 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 I wondered I about, about that. that. You reminded me. 82 to 85, you were commander of the Military Sea Lift Command in the Far East, Yokohama, Japan. Mm -hmm. Tell me about when you're in the Navy as you were for uh, 30 years, and you, you're a captain now, uh, does, does the phone ring and somebody said, this is Admiral so-and-so, you're going to Yokohama? Now, how does that work? Well, uh, you're, you're on a, a, a tour of a fixed length, let's say two years or something. Uh, most, most tours are about two years long. So uh, halfway through that tour, you start thinking, where am I going next? So you, you uh, indicate where you would like to go, uh, both for personal reasons, you know, to enjoy yourself perhaps, uh, or to uh, uh, go someplace that will help me, you know, f develop further in the Navy, uh, or, you know, if it's a command, even better, uh, this is what I'd like to do. And uh, you send that into the Navy and uh, they take a look at it and probably throw it away and say, this is where you're really going. So. Uh, they, they, try, they try to help you out a little bit, and they do a pretty good job of it. So uh, I did not ask to go to Japan, um, but uh, I, w I would have preferred to stay on this side of the pond, but uh, uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it over there. It was a good, challenging tour. Is fitness reports pertinent to this? Oh, absolutely. A fitness report is like a performance evaluation, and uh, your boss makes one out for you. and. Uh, if, if, you're, uh, if you're not near the top of, of uh, you get the top grades, uh, then you're not going to go anywhere. The Navy's probably going to tell you to go home or ask you to go home. Uh, the problem is, like uh, most performance systems, everybody gets uh, graded in the top one or two percent. So uh, 
it makes it a little difficult to really choose those that, that, that should be promoted more or given more and more responsible jobs. And I was just fortunate enough that uh, uh, they needed somebody in Japan. I, I think nobody wanted to go, to be very honest with you. And so I, I didn't really want to go, but I was glad I did. I think that was going to be my next question. When you're at a place like Pearl or, or Newport or San Diego, uh, is there competition for people who would like to go there? Five guys want to take the one job? Oh, sure, especially uh, for command, uh, because there are, there are more people that want command than there are ships available. So, and there are some spots that are, are uh, more choice than others. Uh, so San Diego is certainly a nice spot, Pearl Harbor. But on the other hand, if you have uh, young kids that, uh, you know, you, you don't want to take them to Hawaii for three or four years or two years, uh, you might say, I don't want to go to Hawaii. I'd rather go to, uh, I don't want to uproot my kids. Uh, I want to leave them in, uh, on the East Coast or, or something like that. Do you have that much leeway? The Navy, uh, over, over the last few years, has been very, uh, very helpful to try to accommodate people. In that. And not, not perfect, but uh, they're doing better than they used to. Okay, the Navy says you're going to Yokohama. Mm. What did you do there? I, I had a pretty good job out there. I was uh, the uh, commander of what they call the Sea Lift Command, Military Sea Lift Command, and, and their role was to uh, move um, Department of Defense supplies, equipment, uh, all around the world. And my, my area of responsibility was from Hawaii, really, all the way to the east coast of Africa, so it included the whole Indian Ocean, the whole Pacific Ocean, and uh, it included the. Uh, uh, sh we had ships prepositioned at various spots with supplies that could be used in time of war, which during the Gulf War, in 1990, uh, that's where those sh supplies came from. They came from. They were already prepositioned in the area, and they just sailed over to Saudi Arabia. So I was kind of responsible for that that whole. Uh, program in that part of the world. You were, uh, in essence, uh, a manager of a fleet, a very large fleet. Right. I've got down here 10 fleet oilers, ammunition and supply ships in direct support of naval forces throughout the Pacific and Indian Oceans. That's a, a huge territory. Right. How do you do it? Well, I was responsible more for their uh, maintenance and uh, getting the crews on board and stuff like that. As far as uh, uh, sending them off to perform missions, uh, the Navy fleet commander was responsible for that. In other words, uh, Seventh Fleet out there, uh, the, the ships that I was commander of actually worked for the Seventh Fleet Navy commander, and he would he would actually assign them to responsibilities and duties. My job was to make sure they were fit and, and ready to carry out their mission. Maintenance let, and stuff like that. Let me ask you a question that, that, that's just occurred to me. You're a Navy captain. That's the equivalent in a military command of a, an Army colonel. Well, we're still military, but yeah. In, in the, in well, the, would, would an Army colonel have responsibilities that large, that huge? Oh, an Army, Army colonel would have a uh, command of a brigade, for example, which is uh, a couple of thousand men. Yeah. Um, so I, the, the Navy, I think, uh, does assign uh, more responsibility to its officers and, and uh, decentralizes it more than, than uh, perhaps the Air Force or the, uh, or the Army does. I think the Navy and Marine Corps tends to uh, place more trust and confidence in their, in their Well, that's the impression NCOs I'm getting. That I'm not going to say you were only a captain, but you were running a, a huge show here. Um, one part of it here that uh, Sounds, um, you, you ex explained part of it. You commanded the near term prepositioned force consisting of 17 U.S. merchant ships loaded with combat equipment, ammunition, etc. Do they just sit around waiting for a war to start? That's exactly what they do. They're, they're, these are commercial ships hired by the Navy, uh, leased by the Navy, fully loaded with uh, tanks, uh, uh, armored vehicles, track vehicles, ammunition, food. Uh, in various cargo, medical supplies, um, and they actually sit at anchor 
down at uh, an island called Diego Garcia down in the Indian Ocean. That's right. And uh, it's a thousand miles south of uh, the continent of India. And it's a British protectorate. It's kind of a lagoon down there. And they just sit there. And now they, they get underway and steam around uh, just so, they, so that the uh, grass doesn't grow in their bottom. But uh, there, at the time I was involved with them, they were on call to be in Iran Iran or Iraq or Saudi Arabia in I think four days or five days, something like that. And in fact, when the uh, Gulf War started in, in 1990, they were still there. And uh, that's where they went. They were the first ones to arrive out there. So, so uh, these, were, these were private ships uh, owned by companies but leased to the, leased to the military. And uh, my job was to make sure that they were still ready to go and that, uh, you know, that if they had uh, maintenance problems, we tried to help them out, and things of that nature. Did you ever look at them? Did you ever go down oh, yeah, and look I'd at down them? There. I spent, uh, I'd go down uh, every six months or so, and then uh, I had a guy who was in charge of those, a military fellow who was down in charge of those uh, ships on the spot. And he had to go on emergency leave for a while, so I, I went down for a month or so and, and, and lived aboard those ships during when, that time. When I read a, of the a description of these ships, it occurred to me somewhere there's a computer printout as to what is on every oh, one sure. of these ships. Oh, yeah. yeah certainly and how they were loaded and then what sequence. Yeah, exactly. Sequencing is important. And again, uh, they're, they're, they're loaded. It's funny because uh, about half of them were devoted to the Marine Corps and the other half were devoted to the Army. Uh, so that Ship A over here had Marine Corps stuff on board. Uh, the Marine Corps was responsible for loading that ship they way, the way they wanted so that then when they pulled into the uh, hostile area, uh, the, the right stuff would come off in the right sequence. And of course, the Army the same way. So they, they were actually responsible for what was on there. And, and the Marines had people on those ships. The Army had people on those ships to. Uh, they were all humidity control, temperature control, and that type of thing. And they, uh, the uh, uh, soldiers and Marines would make sure that those systems were working properly so that the equipment was in good shape if it was ever needed. These things were all literally floating bombs. I can't oh, yeah, imagine I mean, any city wanting this to pull into New York Harbor or something like that. That's what they were like down that. in Diego Garcia, right. <laughs> uh, they, they, they had ammunition acts, you know, you couldn't... Uh, you couldn't tie up another ship within X, you know, a thousand yards or whatever of, uh, of a cer certain ships. It was a big lagoon. There was plenty of room down there. Your job also uh, has overall responsibility for repair facilities in Japan, Korea, the Philippines, Singapore. Did you go to all these places? Sure. Yeah. I had to. Uh, I had to. Um, um, arranged for maintenance of, of our ships in all those places. So uh, people that worked on my staff were like the port engineers who would uh, oversee repairs on these ships when they went into the yards. Uh, I had to sign the contract with a repair facility to perform the maintenance and, uh, you know, stay within the budget and all that. <coughs> make up the work package and things like that. In 1985, <clears throat> you were chief of staff, U.S. Naval Forces, Korea. Uh -huh. um, tell us about being there, please. Well, I was there a couple of years, two and a half years. Um, the, the Navy Marine Corps presence in, in um, Korea is rather small. I think we only had about 300 sailors and Marines over there in country, <clears throat> um, as opposed to close to 40,000 uh, Army and Air Force personnel. Uh, but as Chief of Staff of the Navy, uh, I was responsible for uh, uh, helping the Korean Navy in their responsibilities as uh, part of the joint and combined uh, defense of Korea. Uh, I was also responsible for supporting any uh, U.S. Navy, Marine Corps, troops, ships, forces, etc., who would come to Korea for training, port visits, whatever. And at certain times a year, we'd get uh, thousands of uh, Marines would come up from Okinawa for their training, and uh, our job was to support them. <clears throat> Part of uh, your duties there, if I read this correctly, were um, 
a naval advisor to the commander in chief of the US forces and the combined forces command in developing US naval response to hostilities in Korea. Right. Does that mean you sat around and said, uh, if they do this, we'll do this? Oh, sure. Uh, that's exactly what we did. Uh, Korea, of course, is, is, is still a, a, a very sensitive and uh, tense part of the world. And uh, the North Koreans at that time, uh, in the late 1980s, were uh, uh, massing forces along the, the border of North, North and South uh, Korea. And uh, <coughs> it was one, one area of the world that uh, a lot of people thought could break into war at any time. And the, the U.S. forces that were there were really kind of just a, a tripwire to, uh, to hold the line until more forces could come in and, and, and save the country. Well, the forces that were going to come in to save the country were sailors, marines, ships, um, Marine Corps units, Air Force and Army, obviously. And so uh, we had to plan uh, to get the forces there in case of an emergency, uh, support them and that type of thing. And that was one of my responsibilities. When you're dealing with the North Korea, um, did you guys all have firmly embedded in your minds the Pueblo and, oh, sure. and Captain Butcher, uh, Butcher or Commander Butcher and what happened to him? Oh, sure. I, I think that uh, that happened, I think, in 1968, if I'm not mistaken. And I think uh, it, it taught the Navy a lesson that, that uh, you know, we shouldn't send ships out there if they're not able to defend themselves because uh, the Pueblo obviously wasn't. Uh, and we paid the paid the price. So I think uh, the Navy became a little more careful about uh, about where, where we send people. As as part of your sitting around that table, if they do this, we're going to do that. Don't you have to consider, or did you have to consider, uh, your the North uh, Koreans have a missile capability? What? What defense do your ships have against this? Oh, uh, the, m most ships have a, a point defense, uh, which means uh, a point defense system, which would mean they're, they're able to shoot down uh, missiles that are targeted right at them. Um, our, our biggest uh, concern of the North Korean Navy, as I recall, and it's been uh, 12 or 13 years since I was there, 14 years, with the submarine threat, because we, uh, they, they had diesel submarines, which are very hard to detect. And when our carriers came into the area to, to uh, protect and uh, to launch strikes against, uh, against Korea, uh, we were a little bit afraid that the um, North Korean submarines could be a big factor. So I think we had a lot of anti-submarine warfare uh, training and that type of thing both from the Korean Navy and for our own Navy. So that what, whatever hardware the other guy has, has a lot to do how you react. Oh, sure. Uh, we, I think we knew pretty well what the North Koreans said. They had a, a, a large ground force. They had very good artillery. They had uh, special forces who could infiltrate and have done over the years. And they had uh, s uh, submarines. And they had uh, missiles which had a range that could strike well into into land targets and sea targets in, uh, in, in uh, South Korea and Japan, I guess, for that matter. And since then, I think they've got even more. Yes. Yeah. I, I don't follow it like I used to. Though. Well, I think part, I guess, part of the uh, strategic air defense that is being talked about in the United States is a direct result of the capability right. of what North Korea has. Sure. 1987 and 1990, can you tell us where you were? I was in Washington. I was uh, working for the Chief of Naval Personnel, and I was <coughs> responsible for uh, uh, any kind of legislation uh, that the Navy wanted to uh, get passed, which would help uh, personnel issues, pay, uh, retention, getting the right numbers of people, getting them trained, anything that required legislation, I was, I was doing that. I was responsible for that. One, one of the lines from your uh, background that I'm very interested in is you justified to the congressional members and staff 
an annual Navy personnel budget of $19 billion. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? I guess so. If it says how, how do you do that? Well, a lot of it's pretty straightforward. I mean, if you have, uh, have 600,000 sailors on board, which I think is about what we had in those days. By the way, we're down about 300,000 now, uh, or about half the size of what we had 14, 13, 14 years ago. Uh, a, a lot of that 19 billion is just for to pay those those sailors, um, and then uh, you have to convince the Congress that hey, if we want to keep the right mix of sailors and the right talent, r right mix of talents, then we have to pay some of them uh, perhaps a, a bonus to stay, or, or target their pay to uh, encourage them to come into certain fields where we're. Difficult, having difficulty retaining them. So uh, that was a lot of the work, was uh, uh, convincing the Congress that it's, it's money well spent. Also at that time, we were trying to, the, the Navy was growing to a 600 ship Navy uh, from uh, 500 something ships up to 600. So we needed, we needed more sailors, we needed to uh, bring them in, we needed to retain the ones we wanted to retain, and all those things cost money. So. Uh, and we, we didn't want to take any cuts in personnel strength. So those are all the things we were working on during my tenure. And then about the time I left that job, uh, we just, the Cold War ended. And uh, we didn't need 600 ships and we didn't need uh, 600,000 sailors. So then the job became for my successors to get rid of these people, which was, it was a lot tougher to get rid of people than it is to, uh, to, to try to get them in and to keep them. As part of the, the big bucks we were talking about, tell us a little more about the, uh, the bonus program, $700 million. Uh, well, we're trying to, uh, uh, we're trying to keep uh, naval aviators, people who fly our airplanes, because uh, the airlines at that time were paying big bucks to entice naval aviators to get out and fly for the commercial airlines. So we were paying uh, uh, a bonus of maybe twenty-five thousand dollars to uh, an individual naval aviator, if if he or she would uh, agree to stay on for four more years or three more years or something like that. A shipping over bonus. A shipping over bonus, and it was targeted to naval aviators. We we're trying to keep uh, uh, other groups of people like uh, missile technicians, uh, sonar technicians, because they they had the opportunity of being. Uh, employed in the outside at two or three times their Navy salary. So we want to keep these people because, first of all, it costs us a lot to train them. Secondly, they're very good and uh, we don't want to have to train somebody else uh, and go through it again. So it's, it's, it's money well spent to, to give a, a missile technician, uh, you know, $10,000, $12,000 to stay for three or four more years uh, rather than have them go out and work for GE and we have to start with a, a brand new person and train them, which is going to cost a lot more than $12,000. So our, our uh, incentive pay was targeted. Things like nurse anesthetists, I remember, that was a mouthful, but uh, we had a hard time keeping them for the same reason. So we got, a, uh, we got legislation that would give them a bonus. We had legislation that uh, we would entice doctors to join the Navy because we were short on doctors by, uh, if they were, a doctor in private practice, we'd say, okay, we'll, uh, we'll pay your uh, malpractice insurance, you know, that you might currently have uh, in your private practice for the next four years, y even though you're in the Navy, we'll, we'll go ahead and pay you, because the, the way the law works, uh, a doctor is responsible for three or four years later, I guess. So anything to get these people in. And, and so those are little creative ideas we came up with. We had to sell to Congress because it's all money that has to be appropriated. There's a phrase in here that uh, it, it's, it's jargon that I'd appreciate your uh, explaining. Is this what what you just described as force hollowing? Hollowing, yeah. That's uh, that's uh, when you have uh, a 600 ship navy, but you only have enough uh, skilled and talented sailors to man uh, 500 ships. Uh, what you do is you cut and uh, paste and uh, you. Uh, man the ships at 80 percent, 90 percent. You take a sailor who's just coming back from a seven-month deployment and wants to spend some time with his family and because another ship is getting ready to leave for seven months and doesn't have that particular skill, 
you put that sailor on that other ship and uh, after a week at home, there he goes for seven more months. All those things drive people out of the Navy, drive people out of the service. And uh, so those are, uh, we, we try to avoid having what they call a hollow, a hollow service, hollow Navy. In your view, uh, having had the luxury of being a civilian for a couple of years, is this working? Are, are, are armed forces, uh, have they solved these problems? Oh, it, it all depends who you talk to. If you talk to the uh, outgoing administration in Washington uh, um, and, and to most of the Joint Chiefs who were around during, that, during the last couple of years, um, things are tough, but they're still able to carry out, uh, the armed services still able to carry out their missions. Uh, if you talk to the sailors and marines and soldiers uh, at these various bases who are perhaps on food stamps or are working an extra job to, uh, to make ends meet, uh, or who are spending nine months away from their family in places like Kosovo or Bosnia or someplace or on a ship, uh, they can't wait to get out. If you talk to the new administration coming in, uh, you know, they're going to correct all the problems. Uh, so. Um, it, it's not an easy job. Uh, our, we're not at war with anybody right now. We're, we're trying to maintain the peace in several areas around the world. Uh, and I'm not sure our troops are, are trained or equipped necessarily to be peacekeepers like we are in Kosovo and, and places like that. Nineteen ninety-three is that a date? Were you still in the navy? No, I, I got out in nineteen uh, ninety. Ninety-nine, ninety. 90, 90 yeah. Right. When were you special assistant to the vice commander and director of quality military and sea lifts in in Washington D.C.? That, that was just for uh, uh, <clears throat> nineteen ninety-one through probably ninety-three, and then I, I left that job in ninety-three. That was not that was not a very significant. Uh, job, so it, it's, it's not really worth it. But you were out of the Navy? I was out of the Navy. I was oh, okay. working for the Navy okay. at that time. I was not wearing a uniform. All the same, I see that you were responsible for training 9,800 personnel and fleet or ashore. That's a long way for the 290 that you started with when you were uh, aboard the uh, right. well, Lang. I, I, I wasn't actually doing the training. I think I was probably uh, contracting for it or something like that. It was, the Navy went through uh, what they call total quality leadership or total quality management. It's one of those uh, jargon buzzwords which people try and discard after a while. And uh, the Navy went through that phase and I, I took advantage of it by running it for them for a while, a, a part of the Navy anyway. So your, th your 30 years were up in October of 1990. Yeah. And uh, I don't think you ever told us when you got married. I probably did. <laughs> Would you like me to? Yes. I, I got married uh, in 1962, and then uh, um, then I got remarried again in 1993. And you were away from home a lot, weren't you? I certainly was. Yeah. Was there any possibility your wife could be with you in any of these places? Oh, uh, yeah, and uh, you know, virtually all of them, except when the ship. When the ship sailed away for nine months or seven months, uh, my wife stayed home with the children. Uh, but when the ship was in the home port, whether it was Newport or San Diego or a place like that, then uh, it lead a fairly normal life. You know, go out to sea for a few days perhaps, but um, generally home quite a bit. And then places like Washington, D.C., where I was stationed a couple of times, uh, mm -hmm. it was pretty much a <clears throat> nine to five job. We've talked about uh, 30 years of a lot of travel, mm. great experiences, uh, trauma in battle. Um, I know it's difficult to sum up something like that, but is there a most memorable experience in your career that you could tell us about today? Memorable, wow. Oh, in, in my Navy career, I would say uh, commanding, a, commanding a ship of, uh, USS Lang. That was probably uh, the, the most rewarding and the most uh, awesome responsibility I had because so much was at stake. Uh, it, you know, 
you know what happened over the weekend out in uh, out in Hawaii? Submarine. Where, where a Navy submarine surfaced and uh, and hit a uh, Japanese fishing boat. And tragically, uh, you know, nine people are missing at this point. And uh, you know, the the captain of the ship is is absolutely and totally responsible for for that. Yes. And we don't know why it happened, uh, how it happened, but uh, I mean, he's gone already. He he was gone within hours. Uh, and, and, uh, he's been reassigned, has he's he? He's been not? reassigned, right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, whatever whatever goes wrong on the ship, uh, there's, there's, the buck stops there with the uh, with the commanding officer. Then so, let me ask you a personal question: Did you ever stand on the bridge of that ship and think, "Look at me, look where I am, look what I'm doing"? Did you ever think that you would be? Captain of a ship? No, I, I, no? I, I, I was very. It was a very humbling experience because what it. What, no, no, not. Well, I never thought from I'd that be there. sense. No, I just I, the sheer joy of being there. Oh sure, but yeah, you keep that to yourself. It's not your ship, first of all. <laughs> it, it belongs to the uh, American people, and, and you. They entrust you with that ship. They entrust you with the 290 uh, of the the greatest treasure this country has, which is the, the young men. And in, in my case, it was all men. Now it's men and women, but uh, it, it, yeah, it, it's great to say, gee, here I am, mm -hmm. uh, a kid from Boston, what am I doing here? That's it. Yeah. A, a degree That's in economics and look what I'm right. doing. Right, but, but you know, you, you, can't, uh, you can't smell the roses too much because there's always something lurking, so uh, you, you just have to, be, uh, have to be on edge all the time. I was, I'll be very honest with you, it was, uh, it was a nerve-wracking experience for two and a half years. You don't sleep well at night, at least I didn't. Things go bump in the night, and you yeah, you're really responsible. Do. Sleep with one eye open. But <laughs> <clears throat> you have to trust your people. I mean, that's what, that's what it's all about. You have to trust them. And I was fortunate to have people that I could put my utmost trust in. Of course, if anything went wrong, that you know, <laughs> uh, it was my my responsibility. But you know that you know that going in. You've named being captain of the Lang as one of the high points in your career. What about a memorable character? Somebody that stands out you think more of than anybody else? Hmm. Um, well, I had a, um, the uh, fellow I worked for over in Vietnam, uh, who was uh, Admiral, Admiral Zumwalt, who became the head guy in the Navy, the chief of naval yeah. operations, and uh, he was my, my hero for many years. Uh, he um, he did things when he when he had a chance to change the navy for the better. He did it in spite of a lot of opposition. Uh, he brought the navy into the latter part of the 20th century, I think. And uh, he was a he he was a sailor's uh, he was a sailor's sailor. He, he I, I have the utmost respect for him. He influenced my life and my career. He was a, a man very well known throughout the Navy and for the things, as you just said, that he did for the Navy. Through all you, the things that uh, you've told us about that you've gone through, was there a humorous experience that stands out in your mind? Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Can you tell us about it? <laughs> oh, sure. Well, we, had, we had one, uh, one situation where uh, uh, the ship pulled into um, um, a place over in Spain on our way home from a cruise, and um, a couple of the sailors on the ship uh, met a young woman who uh, who really wanted to get to the States in a big way, but she didn't have any money, she didn't have any passport, didn't have any way to get there. So. Like uh, good ambassadors, as I said, uh, we always have to act like good ambassadors. They, uh, they said, no problem. We'll you can come in our boat. We we've got this ship. <laughs> yeah, we have a boat. We'll t take you home in a boat. How do you like to ride in a boat? And uh, they did. Of course, they didn't tell anybody about it. But uh, until about three days out from Spain, uh, somebody did find out and had to turn around and uh, slink back to uh, Spain and drop this poor woman off and then go back home. And arrive home, uh, you know, th four days later than everybody else in the squadron. So that was a little. It, it wasn't funny <clears> at the <throat> time, but I, I can think back now and 
could have been a lot worse. Tom, may I ask you, what did you say to these guys? Uh, no, you can't. Really. <laughs> you can, you can. Uh, they, they did not get in any big trouble. I mean, they didn't? Was, uh, no, not I really. thought that's where your brig experience might come in handy. No, they, 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 they didn't harm anybody. You know. they, they were trying to do the right thing. <laughs> You were discharged at Boston in 1990. Actually, out of, out of Washington, D.C. Ex excuse me, Washington, D.C. And you were a captain, the rank of captain. Um, we know that you have the Medal of Honor. Can you tell us some other decorations you hold? Uh, purple hat, which you get for uh, being wounded in combat. And then uh, several other uh, kind of achievement type awards, uh, Legion of Merit. Uh, three legions of merit and maybe commendations and things like that. And they're just fairly uh, routine, fairly routine. No, no, nothing nothing earth-shaking. May I ask you uh, who presented you with your Medal of Honor? Uh, President Nixon in 1970. At, under what circumstances? At a uh, ceremony at the White House. I was stationed in Hawaii at the time and uh, they brought my family and me to Hawaii. My mother came down from Boston, my brother. Um, big ceremony at the White House. And about 13 or so uh, people were, were awarded the medal that day, roughly 13. And it was a, you know, a very impressive moment in my life. Uh, I'd certainly never been in the White House. I'd never met a president. And uh, they made a big deal out of it. So uh, I, I won't forget that one in a hurry. I should think not. Did you join a, a reserve unit after uh, your discharge? In 1990, no. I, I, I spent uh, 30 years and that was it. How about any veterans organizations? Uh, I'm active in the American Legion here, here in uh, my post in Boston, South Boston. And I belong to uh, VFW and to the uh, uh, AMVETS Purple Hat Society. Is there a group of um, Medal of Honor winners? Medal of Honor recipients. Yeah, recipients. Is. Yes. Uh, there are about 150 of us living right now. And uh, we have a society, Congressional Medal of Honor Society. We meet once a year. And this year, 2001, we're going to be meeting in Boston in uh, September. September 11th through 15th, I think, uh, right down in Boston. So they'll all be coming to Boston. I take it you'll be there. I'll be there, absolutely. <laughs> a fellow named Tom Lyons, who runs the <clears throat> shelter for homeless veterans, he's going to be the uh, convention chairman, and he's putting it together right now as we speak. So it's the first time it's ever been in Boston. We usually go to uh, 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 out-of-the-way places like Riverside, California, uh, Pueblo, Colorado. So, you know, people are going to love Boston. When you came home uh, after your discharge, to wife, family. Um, did you discuss with your family, particularly wife, uh, where you'd been, what you'd been through? Uh, you talking after 30 years? Yeah. Well, no, it, it really didn't. wasn't germane at that point because I was uh, I was not married. So. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. But no, as far as my let's say wartime experiences, I, I never really said much about it. I I, um, I, I told them. Um, bits and pieces, perhaps, but I didn't dwell on it. I, I just went on. You know, I was fortunate enough to go on to new things, and uh, I had my health back and uh, kept looking forward. I should think it would be very difficult to have received the Medal of Honor and not have somebody say, "Tell us about it." Oh well, yeah, it happens all the time, and I, I try to condense it as much as I can, <laughs> and. Uh, you know, if, if anybody really wants to know, I have a, the official citation. They can read the official citation, which goes on and on and on. Uh, but uh, I, I think I described earlier as concisely as possible what happened to, to, to uh, earn, earn me the Medal of Honor. Tom, how important to you was serving in the military? Oh, I, I think uh, it was wonderful. I, I, I enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, it was a privilege to serve, really, uh, and I, I think the, a great mistake that this country has made is uh, doing away with 
National Service in 1972 when they, when they, did, they did away with the draft. Uh, I, I believe that every young man and woman should serve in some capacity, not necessarily in the military perhaps, but provide some sort of public service for a year or two uh, just to uh, help those less fortunate and to, uh, to keep this notion of service alive. Right now, unfortunately, we have a, an all-volunteer force. Uh, it's a much smaller force than we've ever had before. Um, it, it's, it, it's not like in World War II where everybody was united in a common cause to, to save this country uh, and save democracy. Right now, uh, you look around you, you might not find a family in, in your neighborhood that has a child on active duty or who has ever served. And so uh, it's becoming uh, um, a we versus them uh, scenario, mm -hmm. I think. And I, and I think that's very dangerous. We're, we're not a mercenary service. We're not a, uh, like a French Foreign Legion. Uh, this is our Navy. This is our Army. And uh, citizens have to know that and, and bear some of the pain that uh, those that are serving bear, in my opinion. You spent literally half your life in the service, mm -hmm. minus one year. Um, how do you feel it affected the rest of your life beyond uh, when, when you got out of it? Well, it, it made me, uh, first of all, take myself a lot less seriously and take various crises a lot less seriously. Uh, you know, in, in the military, you, you, you come up with real life, real world crises. You, you, you solve them. You, you have people help you solve them. So uh, you go on and, and uh, the, what, what other people might perceive as real, world, real crises don't really fit that category. So you're able to cope a lot more and I think uh, uh, approach things in a more even keel, I would think. I try to anyway. That's a very, very positive way of looking at your experiences. Can you tell us what did you think then and what did you think now about the war you were involved in? When I went, I, I went because I was uh, uh, in the Navy, a uh, Korean naval officer. I had no choice, even though I volunteered, but it was just a, an assignment that I went to. I went over there to do the best job I could. And uh, I, along with everybody else that I served with, I think, uh, can, can proudly say that we did the best we could and uh, we, we did what we were trained and uh, required to do over there. Um, I, I, I think in, in reading about the history of the war um, and uh, reading about some of our tactics, some of our policies uh, subsequent to my coming home, I think we should have approached it differently perhaps and we should not have um, uh, tried to win the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people in the way we did. But uh, that's for the historians to argue over. My, my bottom line is that uh, we that served have nothing to, be sh nothing to be ashamed about. And most of us who served came home and, um, you know, picked up the pieces and went on, on with their lives and um, just like the generation that won World War II for us. That's kind of my next question. Do you feel there was a, uh, a difference in public opinion regarding the veterans who served in World War II, Korea, or Vietnam? I'm sure there is. Uh, I know that even among veterans groups, the mainstream veterans groups, uh, there was some resentment towards uh, Vietnam veterans as they came home because uh, in the eyes of some of these older fellows, uh, these World War II veterans perhaps, uh, the Vietnam, Vietnam veteran was a loser. Uh, he had drug problems. He, he didn't win the war. Uh, he was a crazed killer of babies like Lieutenant Kelly uh, was convicted of being. And uh, people tend to generalize about the Vietnam, Vietnam veteran. <coughs> put him in that box, put him in that category, did not welcome him home with op open arms. And um, some people need that nurturing when they come home. Not having gotten it, they uh, it led them on to uh, some down, downward spirals in their life. So uh, 
yes, I think indeed uh, Vietnam veterans were, were not treated exactly the same way. We've been at this for about an hour and a half. I'd like to ask you, is there, above and beyond everything else we've talked about, is there one thought, one incident, one thing I haven't asked you this morning that you would like to make part of this tape for your family and historians to see? Well, yeah, it certainly is. and it, I'm very fortunate right now that you haven't touched on it, but I will. And um, my present position is uh, uh, Commissioner for the Department of Veterans Services in Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And we have between 500 and 600,000 veterans in Massachusetts right now. And the numbers are getting smaller. The World War II veterans uh, um, are a losing them at a, at, a, at a very high rate. Uh, and a th about a third of those 200,000, or uh, excuse me, about a third of that uh, 600,000 veterans are World War II veterans. It's a lot of people. And uh, we need, or I want to make their years, their remaining years for them and their family as, as happy and as uh, uh, fulfilling as possible. And a program like this, uh, to let younger generations know that there are veterans out there who have done so much for you, especially the World War II guys who, who really saved this country and this world against fascism. Uh, make, make their life better. Do something for them. Hug a veteran. Anything. And uh, follow their example. Use them as role models for conducting your own life. And if the, if the generation that come behind us can do that, uh, we're going to be a great country. Continue to be a great country. Tom Kelly, thank you for being here with us. Okay, John, thanks. Thank you.